name is Paul Slatkis. I'm the host and founder of Good News Broadcast. Uh, a few years ago, I had the uh, wonderful opportunity to get to uh, meet and speak and interview Dr. Barbara Becker Holstein. And uh, with this book, actually, it was called Recipes for Enchantment, A Secret Ingredient is You. The secret ingredient is you, okay? And Barbara and I have become friends over the years, and uh, I value her friendship, and I value her, uh, her intelligence, actually. She's quite, uh, quite smart about, uh, about us human beings, and uh, male, female, and how we uh, conduct our lives. And the good parts and the not so good, and how to get life to be a, a nicer place for ourselves, and, uh, and how to deal with the challenges of life. She actually has uh, been doing this for 26 years. Uh, has a practice along with her husband, uh, Russell Mark Holstein, uh, a PhD, and uh, for Long Beach, uh, New Jersey. And uh, is that right? Long Branch. Oh, Long Branch. Yes. Long Branch, New Jersey. Okay, yes. Barbara, thank you. Helping me already. And so uh, uh, what we decided is that, well, let's make a show together. Um, she has a tremendous four books written. We're going to learn about the books. We're going to learn about her background in the in, in uh, her broadcasting background. She has radio programs, has a wonderful website, and, uh, and some very important information. I love her last book called The Truth and how that evolved and where she's taking her, uh, her career um, in the world of, uh, of, of helping. I think it's all about serving. And, and the big word with Barbara uh, um, is the word positive. And I love that, you know, here at Good, at Good News Broadcast, the word is positive news, moving life forwards. And so welcome, Barbara. Hi. Oh, thank you. Hi. <laughs> yes. Good I'm to so be happy. with you, Paul. Barbara, give us a little bit of background. Are you from uh, the, this area, the no, East Coast? No, I was dragged here by my husband. I decided to keep him a number of years ago, and uh, <laughs> he got a job at Monmouth Medical Center in Long Branch, uh, and I followed at that point, I had got a doctorate in education, and I had all these visions about myself, training teachers, maybe running an art special department in a high school or an elementary school with drama and writing and all these things that interested me. And then all of a sudden, I'm in Long Branch, just like, what do I do? Well, I fell into special education and um, seemed to fall well. I enjoyed it. I loved testing and understanding kids. And that fits some of that quiz, inquisitive, curious style that I've always had. The little girl on the train that makes friends and interviews the elderly woman next to her kind of thing. And um, one thing led to another. I became a school psychologist, a learning disability specialist, a licensed psychologist in the state of New Jersey. And it looks like we were staying. So here I am in practice. Now um, we're up into my um, late 30s, and I'm not going to define age past that point. And I'm running a practice and so on. My husband's in the next room running his practice. And I became aware that something was really bothering me, you know, that there was something in the way women were expressing themselves to me that I felt there was still work to be done with women that hadn't somehow been touched or finished. Yes, the women's movement, there have been different uh, groups helping women, uh, women's psychology, but there was still something off that I was trying to get to. And one of the things, if I can just run right in and... Sure, okay. go, sure. One of the things that I was discovering is that women are very acutely sensitive to negative uh, criticism and remarks. Of course, men get have hurt feelings, of course, too. But men seem to have a little more fortitude, and the studies have confirmed what I suspected then, that they don't take it as personally. Oh, ooh, okay, I just dropped my glasses. That's pretty personal. Okay. Okay, you know, okay, I made a mistake. What do I have to do to correct it? Boom, 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 let's get going again. Well, with women, very much uh, someone will say, you know, I don't know how I feel about that, you know, and all of a sudden the woman is deflated for 36 hours, takes it very personally, thinks that perhaps uh, someone was trying to tell her something for a week or two but didn't know how to get to it, whatever it is. So I decided to develop a questionnaire and ask women more about how they interpreted messages. And I did that. I, I didn't go to my clients because they're my clients and they're paying for my services. 
I went to other women and uh, took notes, interviewed them. I was also curious about childhood messages. Very often women are given a sort of second class message in childhood. You know, like, I mean, some of these messages sound so absurd, but they're real. You know, you're really pretty, so make sure you get married in time. You know, like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's what you've got. Okay, you got know? It. And uh, what do you want a career like that for? That's crazy. This type of thing. And so um, I did the interviews, I analyzed the data, and indeed I discovered that women do suffer many self-esteem blows. We knew it, I knew it. But that's where the whole turn of my career happened because I had this incredible uh -huh, this feeling, this feeling this that sense. I was going to get to something else. And here it was, this aha moment, when I realized sitting at my kitchen table that, looking over the data, the women were also telling me that they had lots of terrific times when they felt great. Well, yeah, that's wonderful. I, you might assume that, but here they were telling me, even after my negative questions, that there were still many moments when they felt totally whole, when they had fun, when they had hobbies, when they did great at work and felt terrific, you know, and, and had corrected dysfunctional things from their parents and did it better with their own kids. But they didn't have a name for any of these special positive feelings. Oh yeah, you could say happy, something very general like that. But nothing special to sort of identify when they were like flying as women in a special way. And that's when I decided to give these parts of ourselves a name. And that ended up being called the Enchanted Self. Um, I decided that if there was a name, a way to kind of document this mysterious way that we all seem to have an ability to feel more whole and have happy moments, we could start to analyze it and see how to bring it more and more and more into our lives. Now the word enchanted self, to me, just the word enchanted, is such a, it's a very positive word. It's a, it's a uh, um, uh, like a, a voyeur. You're looking into yourself, you're enchanted, you're wondering, you're, you're, you're almost even quite questioning uh, uh, your, your, yourself. And, uh, um, but it's also like a very, in my mind, just a word, a high, like you feel enchanted, you, mm -hmm. you know, some enchanted evening, right. you know, right. it's, a, it's a beautiful uh, uh, concept that it's just, you're special and life is special. And is that what you're saying? Are you saying that we're all special? And uh, yeah. and that yeah. uh, and that if someone says is saying something to you to to give it some thought, but the sort of is this all boiled down to self-esteem? Well, Feeling let me go. Let yourself? me go back to the se that we're all special because that's profound, and there are two angles to it to my work. One is that yes, we are all special; that we all can achieve positive states of being that are what we say in loose terms, feeling happy, you know, feeling elated, having a good time. But even more so, the more you learn to recognize what helps you get to those states, and the more you name them and refresh your memory, you know, like I feel good when I am nice to my next door neighbor. I'll just pick something very simple. Um, then you can get there more often. So if you don't understand your own baggage and you don't understand your own interests and talents and even your lost potential and your own curiosity, your own coping skills, if you're just sort of copying Mike down the street, you know, he comes home and watches a lot of sports and seems to have a great life, it's going to be totally flat because the mystery is really how we rekindle ourselves and get our own enthusiasm back again and again and again. And it does reflect back to ourselves. That's one of the correction, there are two corrections that I made in clinical practice right before positive psychology got a label. And, okay. um, you know, I'd like to mention them because Please. they're critical to all the work I then did. Um, the two corrections are 
One, that we teach people how to examine their own strengths and talents, potential, what they're hoping for, what their dreams are. And a lot of this came out a year later as positive psychology began its curve. So let's take a second with that, okay? okay? And it's before you even go to two. So how do you teach somebody that? Okay. Well, I have to mention two to tell you how I teach it. Okay. It does tie, then, right. yeah, it ties okay. in. In order to teach it, and I'm not saying this is the only way, but one of the ways I've developed is one of my specialties. Well, you seem very <laughs> successful with is, this, so uh, let's... Is um, memory um, retrieval work. Now, we have to remember that memory used when you go to a therapist or a clinician or a social worker usually has been used to bring up what's wrong with yourself. This has been a stor historical since the Second World War when is the first time in our country that ordinary people really started to go to seek out mental health care. And the clinician would be there with his or her little pad, be a lovely lady or man, but basically saying, what's your problem? You know, how did it happen? Do you see anything in your past that might have affected you feeling so horrible now, you know? And uh, they're always looking through the past through that prism of what, what went wrong, what was dysfunctional, what didn't work. That, from, I think there's value to that, I'm not dismissing it, but it skews the pathological way that people begin to look at themselves. So I felt that one of the major corrections that had to be made in clinical work, as well as just in the way we walk around and talk to each other, is learning to look to our, path, our past to see what went right, what talents were born, even the summer, maybe your parents were getting a divorce, it was a miserable, horrible summer, but maybe that's the summer you learned to fish, you learned to cook, you learned to mend your own clothes, and you learned to be a survivor. Now, those may not be skills that have per are perfect, but you learned all of them, even in a bad summer. So to understand the story of your life as an access pathway to your strengths and to the, the, the whole framework of who you are, that no matter what was going on dysfunctionally, you just keep getting born and reborn and reestablished. You know, it's the most fascinating journey and story. It sounds to me that uh, one of the emphasis that you're putting on, on our lives is in essence maybe the coping skills. How someone copes and makes situations that might be more difficult, positive, that almost counterbalances maybe difficult moments in our life? Yeah, our coping skills are very important. They tie into what is now known as resiliency, which is a major marker of staying uh, in good mental health. Yeah, because we all have trauma and we all have disappointments and setbacks. Life is difficult. Yes, and I don't know anyone who had a perfect set of parents. You know, my husband and I were just arguing in the car coming in today um, that we were sort of angry at each other because our parents gave us different peculiar things. I mean, we sort of love our own better, you know. <laughs> but the truth is, you all get stuff, you know. And um, so, Yes, coping. I include coping. Now, when the positive psychology movement started and we had many people speaking and writing and doing research in it, um, these same things that I noted before the movement really started have been incorporated as major markers. However, um, I don't think that the movement has fully uh, utilized yet the possibilities of how we'll use positive memory work in the future to help people get to that. There's something exciting, you know, if you watch a little kid like a two, they even like to look at themselves in the mirror, okay? I mean, there is something very personal and intimate about ourselves, and it's not necessarily narcissistic. It's because the energy of keeping ourselves alive is, is so organically tied to ourselves. You know, as, as right? much as we connect sure. with other people. And it is unique. Like I say in my first book, The Enchanted Self of Positive Therapy, uh, a Jewish quotation that, thank you, dear God, for making me uh, unique because if, if I didn't have special traits, there would have been no need for me to have been born. Okay. You know, so with the notion that 
this everybody has a purpose and everybody has a uniqueness so now how do we help someone going back to your question right. I do a lot of work helping people just people intuitively know an age when they had a good year or a good season might be when they were 10 and might be when they were 42 and I'll ask them to go back to that particular period of time and start to identify some of their talents, their strengths, their coping skills, some of the potential that may be emerging that year, um, some of the resiliency that they see that they had, um, some of the ways that they were executing life that they can then transfer to today's situation. And, okay. we'll, and we'll see if we can get anywhere with that transfer. It's almost like in, um, I, don't know, I don't know if you ever heard of a company called Synectix Incorporated. No. And I'm really going back because one summer I worked there in Cambridge, Mass. with all these very brainy engineers and William Gordon was the head of it. If he's still alive, thank you. You are great. Anyway, they would solve problems by identifying the attributes of one system and then seeing how it could transfer metaphorically and okay. very often when you start to do that kind of thing you get a aha moment and you see how you can restructure yourself I, I'm into the belief that you can learn everything from one thing to a certain degree if you really understand that one thing uh, that Life almost, if you can really see all the ramifications yeah. of a situ yeah. of, of, a, of an actual physical, if it's a tennis game, you can learn the entire thing about life through tennis. You can see someone's uh, politeness, you can see someone's behavioral ways, you can see their th thought process. There's, I don't know. We I, don't need as much. I think we much. complicate yes. ourselves right. into many, uh, right. trying to find uh, too many things on the top of the hill, even though we have to really kind of keep climbing anyway. Because we never really there anyway. You're right. I believe that 100%. We really, we, we, we're hard on ourselves. We are I very, think. very hard. And my clients are very hard on themselves. You know, something will be better. And now two other things are just horrible. And they've grown. They've mushroomed in their minds that, you know, something else has to be worked on. But maybe I can take this to how this then emerged into my first book. Please. Okay. So here I'm This is your show. Yeah, we okay. want to talk about well, the things that you're you know, doing. Here I'm sitting in isolation. Truthfully, I didn't even know the psycho positive psychology movement existed, uh, nor did it when I first had, did the rough draft on the book. But I'm in isolation in Long Branch, New Jersey, running a practice, raising two kids, and you know, having a life with my husband. And I wanted to bring forward some of these insights that I had. And um, I did. I, I had this um, book in mind, which I developed. I guess I'll hold it up again, The Enchanted Self of Positive Therapy. And in this book, what I do is help clinicians as well as interested parties, mostly women. On rare occasions, men will respond to the language and um, enjoy the book very much, but um, it, it has a female quality to the writing and to where I'm coming from. And in the book, I describe how you can reframe the way you think about the history of your life, the way you can retell the story of your life to um, augment positive factors, and how you can build a reservoir of positive memories both in sensation you know in feeling level as well as in cognition so that you can keep bringing them forward and seeing how you can transfer attributes of them to your current life so give us an example give us something that the audience can do like okay. today all right so an example would be to go back to a favorite summer let's say it's when you're 10 or 11, okay, we find out you went to camp, you were wonderful at archery, and you loved the sensation of playing archery with the bow and the arrow, whatever, and you um, love being outside and all sorts of things around that. You like the competition, 
And, but there's no way in the world you're going to do archery at 52. It just is not going to make it, okay? For this particular person, it just is like crazy, you know. So we would... It's too bad. Yeah. They should yeah, do it. Exactly. It'd probably be the but thing that make them the happiest. Maybe yes, maybe. maybe no. Oh, okay. Because there is something about letting go of stuff. I mean, I love to play with paper dolls when I was little. I don't think I'm going there again. <laughs> okay. Okay. I okay. still love clothing and, and costumes and other aspects, but I don't want to play with paper dolls, you know. But so there is that childhood. We're going to get to the, the truth yes, here, too, right, right also. Right, and right. Uh, and right. uh, there's something yes. interesting going on there. And so anyway, um, we would decide, you know, maybe this person, instead of archery, wants to do another form of a competitive sport that fits into her neighborhood better, that kind of thing. Um, and it might be playing tennis, it might be something else. Or it might be, as you said, you can get so much knowledge from anything. It might even be that she's just curious now as an adult to study archery, just even find out more about it. You know, she just did it randomly as a kid. What is this whole thing? What did it mean when people went to war thousands of years ago with mm -hmm. arrows, etc.? So it becomes a playful way to open a life experience. Okay. That's a nice thing. Yeah. And uh, I think what people say, like when they, could, people come out of college and life, I think one of the things is, you know, if you were in a room where everybody was, uh, one of these well, bowls or things like that, you go, you go to a room and you, you see who you really want to sit and talk to. And you find, start to get some sense of what kind of people. All right, like take the New York Times Sunday new, newspaper. I mean, it has every aspect of life probably right within that paper of some sort, some article or something. What would be the kind of article that would interest you in, in your life? And, uh, and then maybe to sit back and say, am I close to that? Am I able mm -hmm. to get near that in my life? Am I doing that? Or am I you know, a million miles away and I'm just getting a paycheck at the end of the day? After you know everybody spending ten hours, <laughs> almost more than the half of their life working, so that's right. Um, that's got to make somebody kind of questioning their own existence. Well, I like to do it in a very positive way. And when I, uh, what happened over the years is that once this book came out, the Enchanted Self of Positive Therapy, it seemed to throw me into the public arena, and I just got this inner urge that to keep teaching the public and um, started a website in 19, I don't remember if it was 95 or 96, but I'm pretty sure it was the first woman's website in the field of psychology to go up on the web. Wow. You know, and it was so, what? Congratulations. Yeah, I mean, and, and uh, it was very beautiful, much more artistic than people do their websites now. We had a, a, a woman who was running the website who was also an artist, and they were flowing as a door, Duncan, type pictures and we had stories and poetry and we were just going for it. Um, and then I just kept going for it and this is probably part of uh, the frustration and the beauty of when you get to your passions. You think you have something that is so unique and special that the world will just open up. And um, to some extent it does and to some extent it doesn't because it's still one perception and one life, you know. And what I have seen over the years is that just giving this gift of encouragement out and having my own self-esteem strong enough to um, understand that I don't know where a lot of the tennis balls go. You know, like I have a newsletter, I have a website, and I might not hear from women for a week or two, and then all of a sudden a woman from Africa will write and say, thank you for your exciting uh, article, your encouraging article, and I knew I knew mental, needed mental health care again to get back to a psychiatrist, but until I read your article, I was letting it go. You know, now I went. I mean, you have to just have the humble nature, too, to understand that you probably find that I mean, what could be better than a good news broadcast system? I mean, 
There was once a newspaper out in the West somewhere, in the Colorado area, or Good News Times or something. I don't know that Any, one. Anyway, but, it folded. You know, I mean, the guy had a dream. He had it out for a couple of years. You know. They say you are what you think. And they, they say, you know, if you, if you put positive energy, they're even teaching me this in yoga, you know, you put positive thoughts around yourself right. and, uh, you know, positive friends around you, you know, you're more than likely going to have it be in a That's positive right. mode. That's right. So I just keep on going, you know, like the little engine that could. And um, I could see that this book had great appeal. But not, but not universal appeal. It had a, you know, some class, uh, schools used it to train therapists, and many people have read it and so on. But I had to just keep chugging along. So I, I have, and um, I think that probably the most um, important thing that I've come to realize is that women still need to replenish themselves and find ways to get their own energies going because they're in overdrive, they're stressed, they're tired, they are caretakers, and they don't know how to give themselves permission to get back to the vital parts of themselves often enough. Does that sound crazy when you hear that as a man? I, I, I'm well, curious. I, as a man, you know, I kind of, there are moments that I feel that same, you could have just said men uh -huh. are, you know, um, I'm under the belief though, in me personally, my belief is that there's a certain amount of men that are stressed out and there's a certain amount of women that are stressed out and that I always have a, almost have a 50-50% uh, uh, belief that there's because I also think there's about 50% of men that uh, sort of live like women in, in, in what might be called traditional women roles and 50% of men that, that live in men's roles and the same thing with women. There's some, let's say, very strong women, very strong men, very maybe more on the weaker side a men and maker side women. I don't know, that's been my, my belief mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. there's a little bit of both of us in each of right. us. Right, right. I don't know, do you think that way? I think that's true. I do think that's true. I think perhaps maybe it's more an artifact sometimes of society too, like with aging parents. Usually daughters and daughter-in-laws end up doing a lot more of the hands-on work than the sons and the sons-in-laws. Not always, but just very often. Uh, probably you know, more, more so. I, I would agree to that. In, in the mothering, in the uh, caretaking, the woman is, is, is in charge. And I, between, thank God my mother's cases. still alive, I mean sometimes the whole evening goes between my sister, my mother, my daughter, and a couple of friends. And it's my husband, meanwhile, went out and saw four clients and, you know, earned money and uh, was productive and so on. And he'll say, what did you do tonight? You know, but there are uh, so many other aspects that, that um, they, they are part of my role, you know, and I do feel an obligation and I want it. So... Long story short, and um, we're not even going to really dwell on the two books in between, but they're all up on my website. Well, and what are the names? What are the okay, other two? Okay, we'll just tell the names. This is Recipes for Enchantment. The secret ingredient is you. And uh, I tried to simplify what I said in The Enchanted Self, which I did. It's a very easy read, understanding that we have to get to know ourselves and our own talents and traits. And then I combine it with 30 inspirational little stories that um, are just heartwarming. You could say, um, bring a tear to your eye or a little miracle story. But then when you finish the story, you do a little activity that prompts you to do your memory retrieval work or to design your own future with three things you want to accomplish this year. You know, that kind of thing. Give us a story. Okay. Well, um, one of the stories that always floats right to my mind, because I love my father so much, and the book is in memory of him, Harry, Dr. Harry A. Becker, was his little story. And um, he was out in the street playing um, kickball with a stick, um, or stickball, I guess that's what they called it in the old days. And um, there was a glass bottle in the street, you know, a return that you could return. Now this 
had meaning in New Haven, Connecticut. And so 19... you grew up in New Haven? Yeah. Okay. And you were in Fairfield. I saw you well, went to Fairfield. Quinnipiac. Yeah. yeah in, and uh, he Hamden, used to, Connecticut. He, used to, he was the um, director of, count, of uh, guidance at Hamden High School. Oh, wait. Yeah. I lived next to Hamden High School. Oh, my God. I, so uh -huh. was, I knew there was this thread. Oh, Hamden. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, um, they're playing ball, he, uh, stick ball, and he's about four or five. The other kid's about eight. And my father leans over to pick up the glass bottle, and the other kid says, that ain't worth nothing, Harry. Drop it. And my father says, yes, it is. I can bring it back to the store and get penny candy. And the other boy says, ain't worth nothing to you, Harry. Drop it. Drop it. You know, and so they go back and forth a couple of times, and my father, being the smaller boy, finally drops the bottle, and the eight-year-old runs in and picks up the bottle and says, see you later, Harry. So my father says, what's going on? You said it's not worth nothing. Ain't worth nothing to you. Worth two cents to me. Okay? That's the bottom line. So... Um, this little story, which my father often told us when we had to make a decision and he wanted to make sure we were clearly thinking, um, I use in the book to guide people to, to understand that one of the gateways to happiness, and I developed this in a further paper, is to think clearly and have, develop judgment skills. It's not enough just to go on a retreat and say, oh, this is wonderful. It's not enough. And to believe in yourself. To say, you know, your dad believed in his beliefs and he stuck to them. And uh, whether it was the two cents, which maybe at that time was a lot. It and, was. and in my mind, I'm still a bottle collector. So uh, for the five cents. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, I'm going to continue to be because to me it's environmentally sound right. to do that as right. well. As well as 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 a, as a money kind of thing, and I'm not ashamed. I'm not going to have it. Nobody can knock me down to say I shouldn't do this. I can't do this. You have to kind of. I think the hard thing is to just believe in yourself and to really be positive. That's why I'm so excited right. to get to right. talk to you. Just you know, I mean, we. I, I of course don't do everything perfectly, and someone could make good suggestions to me, and hopefully I'm wise enough to be open-minded, mm -hmm. to hear them, maybe, uh, and thank them. You know, there's nothing more powerful than someone saying, you know, maybe you want to consider doing something differently, you know, in, in, a, in a forward motion, right? right. Not in a, right. in a negative uh, way, but in a, uh, in a uh, constructive. Mm -hmm. I always like that constructive uh, criticism. Yes. That's, a, that's an art. It it's is. It's an art to it's give a, it and it's an right. art to accept it. I heard once someone say, put it as a sandwich. Mm -hmm. The top piece of bread is the good stuff you have to say. Mm -hmm. The middle part is what you need to share that may be somewhat of critical in nature. Mm -hmm. And the underside piece of bread is, again, the good stuff. Interesting. Yeah. That's a I nice thought thing. it was cute. Very good. And then... Tell us uh, about the okay. light. So then we went on, or I went on, uh, to delight which I have published, oh, I, f I didn't bring my other version. This is in two versions. This is a paperback, of course, available on Amazon and my website, Enchant Itself. And the other version is a multimedia um, DVD that you put into your computer. Okay. And once you do, you can read it, but there's also music, artwork, and my voice. Oh. Now that's something that I absolutely did not know how to promote. Very unique, really very beautiful, and I still hope to birth further that uh, the multimedia version because it's so interesting when you see the artwork and you re uh, hear my voice at the same time as the music. Uh -huh. It's fascinating. But again, when you come to something with a tremendous creative mind, it doesn't always mean you know how to do all of the things around it. But anyway. We can only do so much. We can only do so much. And, and that's, that's okay. And that's, yes, yes, and that's okay. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. This book is a series of stories, again, with short exercises following them, actually taken from my own journey, uh, partly a spiritual journey, um, born in as a Jew, and when you're Jewish, you're considered Jewish, no matter 
what happens to you or how non-religious you are. Um, at least that's one interpretation that I tend to stand by. But I never had any education or training, uh, very brought up in a very secular world, you know, with a little bit of the grandparents in the background, but really not enough. So I learned what I wanted to learn. So this is a book that is about my adventuring, but I have written it in a non-sectarian way in the sense that, it, for example, I may have gone to a religious Jewish wedding that is very different than a secular Jewish wedding, but I suggest in the activity at the end of the story, you know, if you can go back to your own ethnicity or choose a new ethnicity or culture to experiment with, what will, you know, try it and see how it feels to get right in there with a festival or an event you've never done. Because it's going to wake you up and make you feel passionately alive in, in a way you've never been. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> let's go. So that's what that book's all about. Now let's get to the latest. Yes, yeah. yeah. so this little book, The Truth. I'm 10, I'm smart, and I know everything. And this little girl really does. She's smart. And you know what? I love this book. I really, I read it you know, uh, last night, and it is a win. She knows a lot, and most of our kids do, boys and girls. And we have forgotten a lot of what we knew so intuitively. We knew it we, to the fibers of our inner core. We knew when parents were misbehaving. You know, we knew it when they didn't treat an animal right. We knew it when they were swearing too much and carrying on about silly stuff. You know, we knew it when they spoiled, relatives spoiled an evening because they went back into family arguments or something. And here we are as grown-ups. And we've covered ourselves with all this sort of insulation, like, like we have cotton batting all around us so we can't get through to a lot of this stuff. And so I felt that this little girl was starting to come through to me and that this was the way to, oh, I'm sorry, oh, okay. This was the way to kind of go from here to here. Okay. You know, here's the theory, a very dense, rich book, and here is the little girl just in a pure way taking the same stuff and saying, get to know yourself, get to know your children, get to know your family, get to know those values that are really the right values, treasure yourself, and when you're right, you're right, what you were just saying. Read the, read the beginning of the, the read uh, of the Little Prince. Oh, the Little Prince quote. You start yes. off with yes. the Little Prince. Yes, let's get to the Little Prince. All grown-ups were children first, but few of them remember it. That's one quote. And the other quote is, grown-ups never understand anything by themselves. And it's exhausting for children to provide explanations over and over again. <laughs> yes, I love it the is. Little Prince. It's exhausting. And she finally sums it up, some of the things that she promises to do when I grow up. I'll travel a lot. I won't look away when my kids ask me tough questions. I'll answer truthfully. I won't swear. I won't get into silly fights with my husband. I'll have fun with my kids and laugh a lot. I'll remember me, and that's the truth. And you see, having read the book, that there's a lot about her trying to hold on to herself as she moves towards adolescence. So, so what do we do now? I mean, first, the, the children should be holding on to as much as they can to themselves. You know, the, the, I think, a lot of times parents give their children that don't, their kids are people too. It was a show on many years, our living mm -hmm. and our thing. And I always think of that like as I dealt with my daughter and now my daughter with her, uh, her son. And so um, as much as I, I th think you can to allow the uh, child to be a real person, they are a real person, there's no question about it. So they should have their opinion of situations and you should be there to Talk to them about it. Yes, and, if, and you can still have the upper hand because uh, there is a hierarchy. There has to be. But that doesn't mean that you can't listen sincerely and not just be sort of, you know, your eyes darting. You just can't wait till you get through with this. 
And uh, particularly for this little girl, she had some very sensitive questions. She didn't even know who to ask them to. Things of, you know, about growing up and dying and um, sex and... So I wonder now, you know, this is your field. I, I, I don't know, I might have maybe not been so good a parent, but I think I did okay. My daughter's actually a school psychologist. Yeah, I saw that. I see that. And with learning disabled, yeah. and she's done very well, and she's a magnificent child, I love her. And, uh, but I actually, even when she was young, would talk about everything. Anything and everything. If it was a sexual comment, if it was a mental comment, or if there was an argument in the house, and uh, I know I always would go back because this one I think is very important to say that we're not arguing over you or you didn't cause that because you know, it's a little kid and the little kid uh, wonders are they the ones that uh, caused con right. conflict yes. in the house. I think that's very important for parents to do overall. But I think as a kid asks a question you should tell them as straight as you can the answer. <laughs> and I, I think you should go for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I agree. And if it's something that uh, has to be said in installments, you can always say, well, I'd like to share this part of it with you now. And when you're a little older, you know, let's even f talk further. And usually that's fine. Kids know, only want to know a certain amount. And they've done some funny shows on TV, you know, where the kid will ask something, the parent sits down prepared to say, share all the facts of life. And, all they wanted to know was the very first level of something. Uh -huh. You know, they, they just Not wanted all the a, details. Yeah, they just wanted an honest answer. Uh -huh. And okay. that's it. So um, this little girl has all the trials and tribulations that we all probably faced, except that she's terrible in sports. She can ride a bike and ice skate and roller skate, but she can't do a group sport. And this creates quite a bit of torture for her because I don't know if you remember how they used to pick teams it yes. used to be it's, quite uh, that's cool. always uh, very uh, very <laughs> yes. sad because somebody uh, is, someone sometimes somebody doesn't even get picked exactly and somebody gets picked last and, uh, and uh, i don't want him i don't want mm -hmm. her yeah that's a tough one so uh fortunately for her she does have a few weeks of paradise when there's a substitute teacher and he's a young teacher fresh out of training and he's doing his best and he decides there will be no teams while he's teacher, you know, and okay. instead they play jump rope and they do gymnastics and stuff like that, but no teams. And so that whole agony is removed for a short yeah, period a nice of time. Thing. I think that people are getting smarter in doing those kinds of things. Right. And she falls in love. And you know that, that you caught that, uh, you found that cute when you saw Paul on the cover. <laughs> Since your name is Paul, and um, I do have to admit that, that there was a boy I had a crush on, uh, although this book is definitely not my life. It's a merger of many clients and uh, friends and, and the ethos of, of my own time period and so on just came together. And what happens in fictional writing is that the characters really at some moment birth themselves. Writers have said this again and again. But um, that's why Paul is on the cover. And um, she really, really is in love. And her parents, are, well, her mother cannot really appreciate this since she's just a kid, just a kid. I worry about my parents because they don't know the truth about so many things. <laughs> and they still fight over stupid stuff. When will they ever grow up? These are, this goes on in <laughs> kids' brains, right? That's right. I'm at least four inches taller than Paul now. Yes. You like this Paul throughout this whole book. That bothers me. I still love him, but I am discouraged. My dad got the job. He told us at dinner, we'll be moving. Yes. So, boy, that, and so many families, I think like 50, 60 percent of the families in the country move. Mm -hmm. That's got to be fairly traumatic. That's very traumatic. A lot of things happen to us in our lives. Yes. And how to deal with them. And uh, she does find a way to hold on to some of the truths that she's learning through a clever um, way that I don't want to really give away, but it ties into a locket and a secret. And um, she's just uh, going to somehow manage, as let's be realistic, most kids do manage. 
they somehow make get, make the best out of things, yes, right? That's and right. And go on to great things, and then you look at them and say, "I wonder how they even did that." You have questions for discussion. Did you identify with the girl in the truth? In what ways? How was she different from you? If so, did that matter? Don't you? This must be a very good book for the, you know, like my daughter's in a book club. Yes, it would be right? wonderful this is, for a book like club. This seems like a great book for a book club. And I'm willing to be on the phone with the book club uh, or join a, we can do a free conference room and I won't charge, you know, assuming they've read the book because mm -hmm. my purpose is for people to read the book and then let's discuss the issues. Okay. The funniest episode or theme in the book. <laughs> What's the funniest episode in, in this book for you? Well, I think that it probably ties into what she discovers in her father's drawer in the, in the night table next to the bed. <laughs> and I really don't want to give that away. All right, you got to get the book for that <laughs> so, one, okay? Because that is kind of special. It's uh, uh, it's. It probably happens in most people's houses, yes. but it's something around, built around the, I guess, the sexuality of life. Yes. And, uh, and it, uh, well, that's something that, why is the sexuality of life such a hush-hush uh, uh, a, uh, conversation? Well, part of it is realistic because uh, children go into a stage of life called latency. And latency lasts somewhere between four or five or six to 11 or 10, 11, 12. And it's built into our brains and, and really we shouldn't be exposed to sexualized stuff during those years. We're sort of designed during those years to study, to play, to... What, what years are those? Um, it, it varies. It could be as young as five. It could be as old as 12. Of course, our culture is so sexualized that for a lot of kids, they can't maintain those precious years. And then when the media comes out even with comedies that have sexual in, innuendos, you know, that even families are watching, right. it really disturbs what is, I think, built in, you could say, God's design or, or just biology's design. But um, these are the years where the brain is learning tremendously fast and um, we're, Kids love hobbies, they love interests, you know, they love, they're, they're designed to be going to school and learning and absorbing and doing chores and playing and running. And, and when you overlay it with sexuality, it's very harmful. Now you have two children, right? Right, growing and, children. Uh, you have uh, sort of two people, parents that are in the therapy business right. of sorts. How, how are they doing? Well, they're doing very well. My daughter's married with three kids, thank God, and, and wow. um, she feels... So you grandma, grandma, uh, grandma? Yes, yes. On that uh, side, yeah. She, she um, you know, I think she feels that she is definitely never going to be a psychologist, but, you uh -huh. know, likes a lot of what we were able to offer in different ways. And um, our son is working and just starting a business, and um, he's single. But um, he's often mentioned that um, I, what, the way he, he enjoys being psychological with his friends and helping them, but he doesn't want to train in it. You know, so I don't know. I mean, we made our mistakes. We all make our mistakes. But um, I wanted to just mention one thing because it's sort of sad, but maybe saying it into the universe will also be helpful. I'm already halfway through my sequel to uh, this little book. And I want to tell you, I, want, I sort of want the world to know how that happened. Um, I was not even sure I was planning the next book. But um, the publisher of this book, Ladybug Press, the woman who runs it, Georgia Jones, um, had a contact with a Chinese translator. And long story short, we became friends through email. And he absolutely loved the book. He asked me if he could translate it and find a publisher in China. Well, this just awakened all my longings, you know, of the world sort of coming home, small, big to small, this kind of thing, and another culture reading what I'm trying to say. And um, we worked and worked, and he found a publisher who was very interested, but the woman said it had to be twice as long and I said to him, well, if it's going to be twice as long, I'd rather just write a new book. 
You know, because okay. for the American audience, I think this is just the no, right that's size. That's good. That's perfect. I you know, like that. That's fifty-minute read. Doesn't that what they want? Okay. <laughs> And so I wrote halfway through. I'm almost done. I mean, it's all in my head, and it's more than halfway done. The sequel, where she becomes 14, 12 to 14, and she has fascinating adventures, moving, you know, adjusting, new boyfriend, the whole thing. And then I get a note from his uh, daughter that he's had a second stroke, and it's just out there. And oh. I feel so bad, you know. Um, you don't just pick up the phone to China. At least I wouldn't know how to do it. So I am really hoping that my friend will recover and that we will follow through. And right. if not, of course, he was a mentor. And that's sometimes what happens in life. You meet these wonderful people that just give you a gift. Yeah, that's a beautiful part of life. Yeah. As this has been a beautiful part of uh, my life, getting the chance to, to share your good news with our community and the community at large, worldwide. All right, well, the way you threw it out there, yep. uh, the truth too, or yes, however you're going to call it. Yes. And uh, let's hope that your friend uh, um, does recover. Yes. But as, a, as, a, as, a, as you say, you know, mentors and uh, a little bit of, uh, of encouragement mm -hmm. to somebody uh, can help somebody really move their life forward. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, your positive mindset um, has one helped me, but also I can see how, in essence, it really, really can uh, uh, uplift somebody through our, our daily life and our daily difficulties within that. Just keep moving forwards, right? That's right. All righty. Barbara, thank you very much. Thank you. So Paul. we were lucky. We have all these wonderful books uh, with the name of the website again, one more time. Enchanted Self, one word, Enchanted Self. Okay, Dr. Barbara becker Bolstein, who is uh, a guest here, and I'm a guest, in essence, on, on her show, which this is what it is, and she's kind enough to invite me to, uh, to be involved with this conversation. I know, we remember, we were going to have uh, some other guests. Yes, I hope about. the next time we will have a resiliency expert. Resil and, resiliency. Yes, which is one of the very important components of helping people in the field of positive psychology you know, learn how to access their strengths and talents and potential and what we can do to help keep ourselves in a resilient mode. Uh -huh. So we'll, uh, she's already on board for the next time and who knows, it could be a mystery guest, we don't know. Uh -huh. okay. But this is something unfolding uh, and in the field of positive psychology with a little different twist than typically. Uh, I love it. So. And I love this, uh, this drawing here. I mean, the drawing in your first book. Yes. That's magnificent. Yes. Okay, Barbara, thank you very much. Welcome, Paul. I appreciate you sharing. Thank you. Okay, tune in again. Thank you.